beating a Camaro. I passed that Camaro like it was standing still. Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. We're here in the steam room of my garage, which means everything in here is powered by steam. We've got all sorts of steam memorabilia on the wall. And this is, I think, uh, and most people do, probably the greatest steam car ever built. No, it is the greatest steam car ever built. It's called the Doble. It was built by Abner Doble. Prior to this, all steam cars required you lighting a pilot by hand using a match or a torch of some sort and waiting 10 or 15 minutes for things to heat up and, and doing a bunch of stuff. This was the first steam car you could get in, turn the key and go. Uh, this car is interesting because it was owned by Howard Hughes. Uh, Howard Hughes uh, was a big Doble enthusiast. He liked it because it was the only car that could match his Duesenberg in acceleration. He went 132.5 in 1925, which is pretty amazing uh, uh, for, for a steam car. Um, we're going to show you how it works in just a little bit. This is a Murphy-bodied car. This is the very first uh, Murphy Roadster with a disappearing top. Now, you've seen other cars like my Duesenberg. This one here, the supercharged car, the green one. That's a disappearing top. That was the most popular uh, body for Duesenberg. But this was the very first, this was the prototype, the first disappearing top car. It does not have roll-up windows, but the top goes down into the back as well. It's really fast. It makes a thousand foot-pounds of torque from rest. Uh, there is no transmission in the car. It is direct drive. You have so much torque, you don't need uh, gears to help transmit the power. This car was originally restored by the Nethercut collection. My friend uh, Arnold Schmidt did uh, most of the work on this, and he did a beautiful job. But it was primarily a show car. Once we got it and we started putting a lot of miles on it, uh, we had to do a little bit of work to it. We uh, made new pistons for it, new rings, a uh, few other things. This requires a very unique blend of steam oil. Most Stanleys, most steam cars run in the 400 degree range, 600 degree range. This runs it's 750 to 850 degrees superheated steam. So that's what makes it so powerful. I think steam expands like 2,500 times at, the, at that temperature. That's what makes this car so powerful. Um, I'm gonna show you how the car works in just a minute because we have a display chassis which makes it a little bit easier. It is the most complex car to restore because everything you think you know about uh, internal combustion engines does not apply here. Most cars, uh, you're trying to get the heat out of the engine. This car, you're trying to keep the heat in the engine. Anywhere heat is escaping, you want to seal that up and do what you have to do because the more heat it has, literally, the faster it goes. Uh, let me show you what it looks like under the hood. Now, although it looks like it might be a show car under the hood here, it's really not. Uh, we run this car a lot. I was running it just yesterday, so it's, it's a little bit grimy. The engine itself is in the back of the car, and I'm gonna show you that in just a minute. I just wanted to show you an overview of, of what, uh, what it looks like when you open the hood. It's very funny when you pull in the gas station, because, hey, could you check the oil? Well, they have, they have no idea what they're doing. It doesn't look like any sort of normal car in any way. Uh, I think it's a great looking car. Uh, what's it, about 142 inch wheelbase. It's a big car, and as I said, it weighs two and a half tons. But it's completely silent. Being a closed system, it burns all the fuel. You have a 3,000 degree fire in here. Let's show you the other side. I'll show you what that looks like under the hood. I love the big drum headlights. That's something kind of unique to the 20s. This is the other side under the hood. Sort of a dizzying array of stuff. You have no idea what it is. You know, when you get one of these, there's really no instruction book. <laughs> you have to kind of find your way. But it's, it's fascinating technology. And once you begin to understand that it all sort of falls into place. But you have problems in these you wouldn't have with 
an internal combustion engine. Water hammers and lubrication problems. And well, water is not a lubricant at all, so you have to inject a little steam oil. This car was a pretty expensive car, something like twenty or $25,000. In 1925, when a Ford was $260, in the handbook it says, things for your man to do every day. See, if you had a car like this, you had to have a man who took care of the car. So it says, things for your man to check on a daily basis. <laughs> Starting the car. Look, there are only, really only 13 steps to starting the car. Couldn't be, couldn't be simpler. <laughs> it's just, just a lot of stuff you have to deal with. You know, it's the kind of car, when it's running great, it's unbelievable. It's the kind of car when it's running bad, it's unbelievable. Oh my God, the problems we've had in this thing. But it's been exciting, it's been a lot of fun. And it's such a labor of love to restore. And it's a real piece of history. It's just such a quirky automobile. Steam was dead by 1925, it was over. And this is that last gas uh, attempt. Uh, you know, from about the early 1800s up until 1910, steam was king. Steam ran everything, trains, boats, so it seemed like the best way to go. But the internal combustion engine, when it came out, uh, it moved so quickly. And then the thing that really did the steam car in was the electric starter, where people could get in the car, you know, press a button, and the car would start and go. They didn't have to get down there and crank it and break their arm or break their thumb. Uh, that was really the death knell. But this was the last gasp, the last chance to try and make the steam car something to, to rival the uh, gas car. And this is probably the only steam car that ever did. No one's ever done a better job of building a steam car than Abner Doble, who was a quirky guy. He came from a wealthy family. Uh, he went to MIT as a young man. I believe he dropped out. Um, he wasn't a very good businessman, liked Preston Tucker, like some of these other guys. Uh, he kind of got into some kind of stock manipulation thing, whether he's guilty or not guilty, I don't know, but you know that deal where you're using money from this guy's car to build that guy's car. He was not a businessman, he was an engineer, and I, somewhat of a curmudgeonly guy. Every car he built was different. E18, this is E20, these cars are completely, not completely different, but different enough. I mean, Abner Dober would build a car, investors would say, this is perfect, let's build I want to make some changes on the next one. Don't! Don't! So consequently, each car was hand-built, and no two cars are the same. Uh, the fuel delivery system a little bit different in that one than it is in this one. Uh, but this is the pinnacle, 1925, and I think this is the, the best one he ever built. Because, uh, hey, it's good enough for Howard Hughes. As you can see, it's a two-seater, but it has a rumble seat. It comes out this way. This goes like that. And you can put people back there. Oh, that's real safe, huh? Yeah. But that's so, it turns into a four-seater car. <laughs> it's it's uh, kind of cool. And then your top comes up, this opens this way, and the top comes up as well. This is your fuel filler here, your gas cap, for lack of a better word. Why they put the gas gauge back here makes no sense to me, but it is. But as you can see, there are 13 screws holding this on. There's no reason you need 13 screws. The reason it has 13 screws is Rolls-Royce had 12. So Doble said, hmm, well, I'm going to make 13. So he put 13. I, it's one of those weird, OK. I don't get it. But that's, that's all right. So you want to take that off, you're going to be there all afternoon. But let's go over and show you the chassis and show you how that works. We have this chassis because it's a lot easier than trying to visualize what we're talking about here. This is a cutaway chassis of a double steam car. Let's explain how it works. You turn on your ignition, you turn on your key, an electric fan spins down here in this, what's called the draft booster. You might think of it as a supercharger. A Scirocco type fan, it spins quickly, forces air through the venturi of the carburetor. And as it goes through the venturi of the carburetor, it picks up speed, suction, pulls gas from the float bowl, throws the gas into here. Now what you have here, you see 475 linear feet of steel boiler tubing. This is not a boiler, this is a steam generator. A boiler is where, it's like a tea kettle, you heat up 15 gallons of water at a time. This you're never heating up 
more than a quart or two at the time. Two quarts at the most, but a little, a little over a quart. Okay. Heat is forced down. Most steam cars, the heat comes up from the bottom. This heat is forced down. You have this tubing, which gets smaller, produces 750 pounds per square inch of superheated steam, a million BTUs in 90 seconds. When this thing is really up and running, it's making about 2 million BTUs. But initially, a million BTUs of heat. Heat comes back, steam comes back here, hits your compound engine. This is a four-cylinder compound engine with a high-pressure piston and a low-pressure piston. Now, what that means is you have four cylinders, but the steam pushes on both sides. Steam pushes it up. Steam pushes it back. An internal combustion engine, it's one, two, three, bang, one, two, three, four, bang, one, two, three, four, bang. This, every stroke's a power stroke. So I think it's safe to say you would have the same number of power impulses that you would have in a V16 engine. I think that's fair to say. Because steam makes so much torque, there's no transmission. It's direct drive to the rear wheels. And let me show you how this works. Here we go, press this button here. All right. That shows you how the engine works. See, it's direct drive to essentially your axle right here. Your crankshaft is here, and there's your uh, direct drive right there. Now, the way it works is the steam, steam gets used a lot. It comes through here, goes through the high pressure piston. What steam is left over leaks over to the low pressure piston. Uh, then, the steam is not done yet. Notice we're also driving right here. Besides driving the rear wheels, we're also driving an auxiliary shaft. And this shaft runs your water pumps and your oil pumps that pumps oil into your steam engine. Because as we said before, water is not a lubricant, so the, the steam gets pumped in under extremely high pressure, 200 pounds per square inch. Okay, now the steam, once it exits the engine, it comes back up here hits the draft booster again, overrides the electric engine, and forces gasoline into the engine harder and faster. Uh, now, here's the real genius of this thing. This is your control unit. This controls, as you see, all pressure and functions of the water pump. In here you have about uh, six pieces of crystal about this big. And it sits on a metal shaft. And since glass is not expand or contract, but metal does. What happens is, let's say my finger's the crystal. Okay, as it gets hot, the metal expands, pushes the crystal forward, hits its contact, shuts off the fire. That's how you regulate it. Then it cools, fire comes back on. So as this goes down the road, you hear kind of a maybe three or four times a minute as the fire comes on and off, okay? Uh, that's how you control uh, the fire. That's how you keep it at 750 degrees. But the steam is not done yet. The steam then exits there and hits these two turbine wheels. Uh, those two turbine fans, um, <laughs> you know, these were built by a company in Worcester, Massachusetts, way back in the 20s. The company was still in business. And I called them up and I said, hey, I need some turbine, uh, I, I need some turbine wheels. Can you make them? No, nah, we can't make them. And I kind of shamed the guy. I said, you know, your grandfather made it in 1925. You mean to tell me this many years later you can't make something your grandfather made? So finally, we, they, they were so embarrassed. All right, send us the wheel. We'll, we'll make another turbine. So they made the turbine wheel. I mean, they were crazy expensive. But anyway, these two spin, OK? It spins the fan, OK? Then the steam exits there, goes here into the condenser. This is not a radiator. It's a condenser. The steam goes in there and the steam is cooled immediately by the fan from the turbine wheel. Now, you remember that little experiment uh, you might have done in science class where you heat the water and you hold the plate and the steam goes up and hits the plate and then comes back down and there's rain or comes down as water? That's basically what this is. And you reuse the steam over and over again. So you know, this thing is so complicated. Okay, now you have to lubricate it. So what you have here, this is your auxiliary unit, okay? It says, it's the heart of the Doble car. This unit contains a 12-volt motor generator, four piston water pumps, air pump, two vacuum pumps, and a partridge in a pear tree. But you only have one spark plug. <sighs> How easy is that? And these spark plugs last the life of the car. I've had the plug in my other Doble for 10 years. It 
fine. Nothing ever goes wrong with it. That's basically how it's supposed to work. And on a good day, you can get it all working. Doble says you're supposed to get about 1,200 miles on a tank of water. No way, no way. Uh, the most you might get is a couple of hundred on a cool day. In the summer, you get less because uh, it's not condensing. It's, it's, you know, you're putting 850, 750, 850 degrees of steam into there. On a cool day, it'll cool it and turn it back into water. Sometimes it overrides it. That has a safety valve. And if it, if it can't condense at all, it, it just vents to atmosphere. But that's basically the way it works. Uh, what you have here is when you start the car, you pull this up. That engages your manual water pumps, with, which fill these tubes with water before you start. You don't want to turn on your fire with no water in there because you will scorch the tubes, basically. Uh, but that's kind of how it works. Did you follow that? Is that a little confusing? It is. And the fun thing about these is, you know, even... Uh, We've had engineers from General Motors and Mercedes-Benz, and you get to be a big shot. Well, let me explain that to you guys again. You know, I didn't go to engineering college. I don't know. But when you work with these, it's great fun. But you'll be amazed at how much torque it has uh, and how powerful it is. You know, the advantage is there's no shifting. You just get in, and you go. You step on the gas, or you open the throttle, and you pull away. You know, don't forget, 1925, you're grinding gears and pushing clutches and all that kind of thing. None of that. It's just direct drive. Uh, the disadvantage is the engine is always engaged. There's no neutral. But, you know, it's probably time to put this all into practice and uh, take it for a ride. Now, the first thing you want to do when you get in a Doble steam car, I see people much shorter back then, you pull the handbrake. Because what that does is not only works the handbrake, it also opens a drain cock, which means any water that's in the cylinder that's left overnight will drain out. Because as you know, water cannot compress. And if you try to pull away with water in the cylinder, boom, you just break everything. Okay. First thing we do is turn on the ignition, and I turn on my water pump by pulling up this plunger. You hear water pumping. Okay, see the, see the pressure climbing? Okay, that's water. It's about 500. Uh, put the pumps down. And I turn on the burner and watch the window down there. Now we don't want to pull away until I have temperature reading here. Pressure shuts off at 750. See, so I will crack it just a hair, let some water out. Pressure goes away. Pressure and temperature start to build up again together as a unit. Now, when you see that fire in the window, you see the fire going in a circular motion. That uh, cream colored paint you see on the inside, that's a plasma coating that. Uh, just works phenomenal. It's good for about six or 7,000 degrees. We put that, it's, a spa, it's kind of space shuttle material. And uh, we got them a plasma coating company. They put it on with a laser. And you can put on a piece of metal, put that on there, put the piece of metal in your hand, hold a welding torch to it, and the heat doesn't come through. So it's worked terrifically for this. Because you've got, as I said, 3,000 degrees. If you want to know more about that plasma coating, look up the other Doble we did the web shoot on. We, show, we showed you there how it was done. Okay, I'm just trying to get a lot of heat in it now. This one here is pressure. You haven't seen the temperature needle yet. It'll come up in a minute. Okay, it's starting to come up now. Here it is. See here? We're at 250. Top it off with water. Now, if you want to go fast, we use Evian racing water. No, not really. That's just being stupid. And we are ready to motor.
The amazing thing is just how quiet it is. We used to call steam the hand of God because the torque just pushes you. You're not letting out a clutch or anything like that. Right now, my temperature gauge is about 650. See, the hotter it gets, the more I can close the throttle because I'm using the steam more efficiently. I'm so glad we put the disc brakes on this thing. Oh my God, I used to go sailing through red lights. Excuse me, sorry, excuse me, sorry, sorry, steam car. You know, those glass crystals I spoke about work perfectly. Kind of makes you wonder what, uh, what they can do with modern technology and computers and stuff with steam. Now, there's no gas pedal in this car. As you can see, I'm controlling the throttle through this inner wheel. The reason you have that is because there's no butterfly valve. With a thousand pounds of steam pressure, it could hold it open. So this works on a sort of a screw in, screw out technology here. Well, you literally glide through modern traffic. There's no noise. Imagine back in the 20s when cars are pretty noisy. They backfired and all kinds of things like that. This thing was dead silent. Okay, now everything's getting nice and hot. You'll notice I have almost 750 degrees of steam and a thousand pounds of pressure. Now that it's warming up, I'm using my steam more efficiently, so I'm using less fuel. The amazing thing about this vehicle is you're able to maintain steam pressure. You know, the Stanley steam car, if you had 600 pounds and you're going down the road, you could not make steam faster than you're using it. This, you can. Stanley, you'd have 500, 400, 300, 200. Then you have to pull over, build up a head of steam, and pull away again. With this thing, you can go 65, 70 miles an hour and maintain 1,000 pounds or between maybe 800 and 1,000 pounds of pressure. That's vacuum there. And when I shut off the throttle, I'm now pulling water in. It's such an eerie sensation to have so much torque. It's so little throttle. You just touch the throttle and you get this tremendous shove. Although this thing is only rated at 150 horsepower, it's a thousand foot pounds of torque. And unlike a gas car, watch, it doesn't scare the horses. See, that horse never knew I went by. I would say she's fully warmed up now, and I just barely have to crack the throttle to maintain 40 or 50 miles an hour. I mean, this was a very fast car back in 1925. There weren't many cars that could do a mile a minute. As you can see, 60 miles an hour is no problem. And the more you maintain that, the higher your pressure will build again. You know, it's really an exciting car to drive. You don't drive it so much as sort of pilot it. It's, uh, it's just so different. You know, I consider it such an honor to be the custodian of this car because we've been able to uh, to uh, fix it and get it running properly. Um, it was done nice before, but it didn't have a lot of miles on it. We put about 3,000 miles on it. Uh, we've been through two sets of pistons until we got something that fit exactly right and got the metallurgy right. You know, you got different metals expanding at different levels and it, it's very confusing. It took a lot of work, but I'm glad we got there. The guys did a great job. Even when they pass the camera car, there's no sound at all.
Matt Howard Hughes had a lot of fun in this car blowing off everything else on the road. Now, even when it was new, this car was something special because each owner saved it and preserved it for the next guy. Another cut, of course, went above and beyond when they restored this thing. Did just a beautiful job. What we're going to do now is what they call blow down the engine or blow down the steam generator. You do this every couple of hundred miles or maybe every second or third time you take it out. This gets all the scale out of the pipes, out of the steam generator. This is George Swift. George, uh, when we started, George didn't know anything about steam engines and he's become sort of a master Dobel mechanic. He rebuilt this motor and got it to where it's running now, so he's done a terrific job. And uh, he came from the internal combustion world, so we had to, but uh, he picked it up pretty quickly. And this is probably, I think, one of the best running Dobels in the entire world. When we take it out, we put 3,000 miles on it and it runs terrific, so we can thank George Swift for that. But he'll show you how we blow it down now. Go ahead, George. Now we do the Doble down. What that does is blow all the scale. You know, if you got hard water, that blows all the scale out of it. And now we're ready to uh, put it back. I can shut it off and I have enough uh, power to get me back into the garage. Well, I hope you liked this little bit of history lesson on uh, steam cars. You know, I watch a lot of the car shows where the people yell and throw wrenches at each other and this kind of stuff, and I, I don't quite get it. So we try to highlight or educate a little bit to folks to some of this lost technology, and uh, I, we hope you appreciate it. We really enjoy doing it, and uh, we enjoy reading your comments and hearing from you. So uh, that's what we'll keep doing here. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks. Mm-hmm. <laughs>